Now, I sent out a notice late last night. Did any of you uh, have the opportunity of reading Philippians chapter 2? Good deal. Somebody want to teach it this morning? <laughs> okay, what we've been doing is starting with a New Testament passage, and then we go back to the Old Testament. And in Philippians chapter 2, let me just bring this up a little bit more. Well, that's okay. In Philippians chapter 2, uh, realize that Philippians is one of the prison epistles. You have Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. The Apostle Paul's in Rome. And he's in prison there. And he sends, uh, well, actually, the church at Philippi send Epaphroditus to Rome to visit Paul in prison. And on three occasions, they basically sent money to him so that uh, he could have his needs met when he was there in, in Rome. And so the letter to the Philippians, to the church at Philippi, is basically a thank you letter. And he starts out by letting them know where he is, what he has experienced. In fact, if you look at uh, chapter 1, you see that he is in prison, and he is actually chained to some Praetorian guards. And uh, I like that concept of his chains to these guards, because that means that the guards are also chained to him. And what are you going to talk about when you are chained to two people? You're going to be talking about something that's on your heart. And with the Apostle Paul, it's always the Lord. And so even though he was chained to them, they were chained to him. So he had a captive audience, very realistically. And he would share Christ. In the process of time, these guards were starting to come to faith in Christ. And that's why Paul says in chapter 1 that the message of the gospel is actually going throughout the entire Praetorian Guard right into uh, the household of Caesar. So he says, I am bound in change, but don't sit there and pity me because of that. You should be rejoicing over the fact that I am in change because the gospel is getting out there. Not only that, but also since I am tied down, more believers are out there sharing the gospel. So now we have a fantastic team of evangelists going throughout the uh, world, literally, preaching the gospel. And then he goes on to say that they have been bound themselves with Christ. They are one in Christ. And that's how he starts out in chapter 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only uh, should look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Father God, as we look into your word this morning, once again, we call out to you and ask that your Holy Spirit will be our instructor, that he will give us eyes to see and ears to hear, minds to understand, and wills to respond in humility and in obedience. We ask in our Savior's name. Amen. There's an if clause here, actually several if clauses, and in the Greek language, this is in a first-class condition, and instead of raising doubt by saying, if you have any encouragement, <laughs> he is saying, since you have encouragement from being united with Christ, since you have comfort from his love. 
since you have fellowship with the Spirit, since you have tenderness and compassion, because of all of this, make my joy complete by continuing with what you already have, the foundation that you have uh, established in Christ, build upon that foundation as you relate to one another. So be like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, and do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Look out not only for your own interests, but look out for the interests of others. And then he sets the bar real high. He said, let me tell you what I'm really talking about. You have been united in Christ. You have Christ's love, the fellowship of the Spirit, all these things. Now express that to one another. And to give you an illustration, an example as to what you should really look forward to, look at Jesus Christ. That's what I'm talking about. He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ. Now, I love the NIV translation. <laughs> but there are a lot of what we call NIVisms. Like, why did you translate it that way? <laughs> because he translates a verb like a noun. He said, let this attitude be in you. Well, it's actually a verb here. And he's saying, I want you to keep on thinking like Christ. That's what he's getting at here. Keep on thinking like Christ. The same attitude, the same outlook as Jesus Christ. And he starts, actually, with Christ's pre-incarnate state. Who being in very nature God... This is a Greek word, morphe. We get our word morphology from it. Being in the very essence of God. Jesus, who was God, remember in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So here Jesus, who is God, did not consider equality with God something to be seized, something to be grasped. You see, Jesus could have come to this earth and said, hey, I'm God, you're not. Now, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, and you guys better shape up or you're out. No, he didn't come that way. He could have come that way. He had all the power. He had all the wisdom. Jesus is God. So, being in the form of God, or the very essence, being God, he did not grasp at all of those wonderful attributes and qualities. But he made himself nothing. It's a, a Greek word that means he emptied himself. He emptied himself of the use of most of those great attributes of God. God is sovereign. Jesus is sovereign. But he actually emptied himself even of that sovereignty and allowed men to beat him, to spit on him, to strike him, to nail him to the cross. He could have stopped at any time, but he did not grasp after that divinity, but rather being man, being made in human likeness, take the very nature of a servant, the very essence of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So we have Christ pre-incarnation, pre-existence, being God, and then we come to Christ's humiliation. Even though he was fully God, he became fully man. 
And he did not grasp all those attributes that he could have held on to being God. But he emptied himself and allowed himself to be rejected, to be beaten, to be hated, to be spit upon. And he became obedient to the Father and to the Father's will, even to the point of death. Therefore, this is a great therefore, because of his humiliation, because of him emptying himself of, of the use of these attributes, therefore God exalted him to the highest place. The highest place is at the right hand of the Father. They gave him the name that is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Pre-incarnation, humiliation, exaltation. Is that not what First Peter tells us? Humble yourselves before God. And in due time, at the right time, he will lift you up. God despises the pride of man, but he gives grace to the humble. And we see that in his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who emptied himself, took upon himself the form of human likeness, became obedient even to the point of death on a cross. Because of this, the Father highly exalted him. And one of these days, all those, all of us will bow before the Lord. Even those who don't believe in him, even those who take his name in vain, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Jesus is Lord. What I'm going to do, in fact, on our first slide, we're going to see how you can take a passage of Scripture and outline it so that when you look at it, it makes a lot more sense. All right. So we're just reviewing Philippians here. Since you have encouragement, comfort, fellowship, tenderness, and compassion... This is your foundation. And everyone here this morning, I want you to know what you have in Christ. So, because you have this, Paul is saying, make my joy complete. And do what? Be like-minded, have the same love, be one in the spirit and purpose, doing nothing out of selfish ambition, doing nothing out of empty conceit, consider others better than yourselves, and look to the interests of others. Now, when you say this is countercultural, I mean, everything you've ever been exposed to or ever heard out of the mouths of others or out of your own mouth or what you have thought. And you look at this and you say, that does not line up with reality of what I face every day when I go to work or in my neighborhood or even in my home. What Paul is talking about is totally countercultural. But he said, you all can do this because of what you already have in Christ. You have the ability in the power of the Holy Spirit to actually look out for the interests of others and not only your own interests. And to consider others better than yourselves. You say, wait a minute. Now that's going too far. <laughs> uh, not according to the Apostle Paul. Because what example does he give? Jesus Christ. Now, how did Jesus Christ consider us better than himself? I mean, he's fully God. 
So, how could he consider us better or more important than himself? By becoming obedient to the Father's will, even to the point of death. In other words, he considered your life more important than his own. What is the word better, better than the Greek word? Better than? Just, I'll get my Greek scholar to look it up here. By the way, I want to welcome my son here this morning. <laughs> He's usually preparing his sermon for preaching the next day, but since uh, someone else is preaching, he's here. The reason I ask is because I've always thought of it as thinking of others first. Yeah, I think it's uh, it'd be Hooper. Hooper Echo. Uh, Hooper Echo. Okay, having more than that's that's how it would be. Hooper Echo. Echo is uh, to have. Hooper is more than. So, Jesus saw us of having, actually, your your life, your eternal life, is more important than my physical life right now. Therefore, I will go to the cross on your behalf. Good question, Meg. <clears throat> Make my joy complete. Now, here's the verb, and it's in the present tense, and it's a present active imperative. An imperative means it's a command. So, keep on thinking like Jesus. Keep on looking at him as your model. <coughs> Being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but instead emptied himself, taking on the very nature, very essence of a servant. Being made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as a man. By the way, that's a word, Greek word schema. We get a word schematics from it. Being in the very appearance a man. He humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Can you see how you can just take a passage of scripture and follow Paul's thinking. One of the things, the assignments we had one time in seminary was to outline one of Paul's arguments. And you start way over here on this side, and, and pretty soon you're way over there. And then eventually he comes back to his second point over here. It's a, it's a fun process to uh, go through. His exaltation... God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every tongue confess Jesus as Lord to the glory of God. Oscar, can you can you see everything on that screen now? Yes, sir. Okay, good. This is known as the hypostatic union. And that means Jesus is 100% God, 100% man. Those two essences are brought into one being. Any questions on that? You say that's not on? I see up to exaltation and then the first one or two lines. Okay. All right, we're going to have to bring that. See, see if this takes it back further. Is that okay? I now can see three lines probably. Yeah. A little bit more. Yes. yes. All right. I want to make sure we're getting the whole screen on there. Yeah. All right. Let's now <clears throat> look at Jesus in Genesis. By the way, I find ten very specific references to Jesus in the book of Genesis. We've already looked at 
Jesus, uh, Adam being a type of Christ. Uh, we are told in Romans 5, 14, as did Adam who was a pattern of the one to come. So Paul is telling us that Adam is a type, tupos, we get the word type. So Adam is a tupos, a type of Christ. And last week we looked at the similarities between Adam and Christ. And then we saw in Genesis 3.15 this whole idea of seed. And that seed in the New Testament is identified as Christ. Whereas God is speaking to the serpent, he said there's going to be, well to uh, Eve, that uh, there's going to be a, a battle between the two seeds. And he says to the serpent, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So, whatever the seed is, is going to crush the head of Satan. And as we looked, we find that the seed that is going to crush the head of Satan is going to be Jesus Christ. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. So we look at the New Testament often to interpret the Old Testament. Because you have shadows, you have types in the Old Testament, but you're not, if you're just living in Old Testament days, you wonder, well, who is this? And we're even told in the New Testament that, that the prophets of old were wanting to know. <laughs> I mean, they would be making these prophecies and then they'd scratch their head, I wonder who I'm talking about here. God has given me this vision. I wonder what that means. God is giving these, me these words and I'm speaking these words, but I don't even know what I'm saying. And I can imagine the prophet Isaiah, when he's writing Isaiah 53, here is writing all this down, and after he's finished writing it down, he must be scratching his head. What is this all about? So we have the advantage living in the 21st century and having the complete word of God, the complete revelation of God, to find out what the prophets themselves did not even know. Now, I want us to follow this seed. I call it the second generation of the seed. And we are told that Adam lay with his wife Eve. She became pregnant, gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to his brother Abel. So this is after the rebellion. And so even though Adam and Eve were created innocent, now you have two sons who are brought forth, but sin has already occurred uh, there in the garden. And now the family's outside the garden. Now let's compare Cain and Abel. Cain, he was a farmer. He offered, when it came to offering offerings to God, God revealed the kind of offering that man should offer to him. Cain had a better idea. He was not going to offer the type of thing that God wanted. He was going to offer what he was able to do on his own. Being a farmer, he planted crops and he brought the best of the crops. This sounds like a wonderful offering. It just isn't what God had expected, nor what he told them to bring. So God rejects Cain's offering, and so Cain sees with anger, and he's jealous, and he eventually takes the life of his brother. Abel, on the other hand, was a shepherd. He offered fat portions, which meant there had to be a blood sacrifice. No sheep gave up his fat <laughs> without bleeding. God accepted his offer, and Abel was at peace with himself. So what happens? Well, let's follow this whole thing, because you have two lines now. Eve has these two sons, Cain and Abel. 
And notice what it says about Cain. Well, first, he kills Abel. So now there's only one son. And we are told that he went out from the Lord's presence. And I don't have all of Cain's line here, but if you follow Cain's line, you discover that they went out from the Lord's presence. Uh, Cain was a murderer. Later on, we read about a man, man named Lamech who did the same thing that Cain did, and that is took a man's life. That's the lineage of Cain. So what happens? Because now Abel's gone. There's only one son. So God, in his, by his grace and, and by his love, allows another son to be born to Eve. And his name is Seth. Now, when you follow the line of Seth, you get a very different picture. Because we are told that from Seth came Enosh. And you say, well, what's so important about Enosh? Well, at that time, men began to call on the name of the Lord. So we have Cain's lineage. As it goes out, they're not calling on God. But through Seth, through Enosh, men began to call on the name of the Lord. And Enosh has a son named Enoch. What's so important about Enoch? Later on we're going to read more about Enoch. But we are told that Enoch walked with God. And he walked with God and all of a sudden God takes him. He, he just disappears off planet Earth. Isn't that the way we'd all like to go? <laughs> just walking down the street one day, minding your own business, and all of a sudden, whoosh, there you go. Enoch has a son. His name is Methuselah. Now, the only thing we know about Methuselah is that he lived longer than any other man, 969 years. That's a pretty long time. And I often wonder why in the world is he even mentioned other than the fact that he lived longer than anyone else. Well, when you look at the root of his name, it means his death shall bring it. And you think, so? What? His death shall bring what? Well, let's go a few other generations. And we have a guy by the name of Noah. And, of course, Noah found grace or favor in the eyes of God. And the flood came when? the year Methuselah died. When you think of the name Methuselah, think of, the, think of God's grace. Think of God's patience. For almost a thousand years, God is waiting for man to repent of his sin. God is giving men chance after chance. We're going to find out in a few minutes, the fact that Enoch was a preacher. And he was a prophet, and he is prophesying things that are going to happen in the future. And his warning people, we find out that Noah was a preacher. And Noah is preaching as he's building the ark, he's, he's a preacher of righteousness, and he preaches and he preaches and he pleads with the people to repent, to turn to God. And they all laugh, and they're looking at this old man out there in the desert building a boat, wondering what in the world is he building a boat out here? There's no rain, there's no water. What in the world are you thinking? And he says, a flood's going to come, a flood's going to come. You look up at the sky, and it's a bright blue sky. That sun is shining, nothing is happening. And he keeps on preaching, repent, because a flood's coming. God's judgment's going to come. You have an opportunity to turn to the Lord. And, and be saved, and they just made fun of him until the day that the flood came. 
And that same year, Methuselah dies. Because now we find out what shall bring it, or what it shall bring. It's going to bring the flood. And of course, generations go by, and from Noah comes Abraham, and from Abraham comes Christ. And so when you trace <clears throat> the line of Christ, it goes right back through Noah, Methuselah, Enoch, Enosh, Seth. So you have an ungodly line of Cain, you have the godly line of Seth. And that's all found in Luke chapter 3, verses 23 to 38. It's often good to look back at your lineage and find out where in the world did I come from. And uh, some of us might have a, the shock of our lives when, if we could go back far enough to find out who all was in this lineage. But we also might be shocked by find, finding out that there were righteous people that we never even heard of. You may even come from a lineage where maybe your parents or your grandparents or great-grandparents uh, didn't know the Lord, but somewhere back there, Maybe the great-great-grandfather or the great-great-great-grandfather was a man of God. All right, let's look at this third concept of Jesus in the book of Genesis. I find him there in the garments. Garments were God's provision. It says, the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Now, there's a contrast between what they did to deal with their sin and what God did to deal with their sin. And what Adam and Eve did is what most of us would do. Cover it up. <laughs> Try to just deal with the guilt aspect and not the sin part. The Hebrew word for atonement is the word kafar, and it means to cover up. But they used the wrong cover. This was a foreshadow of the cross, where Jesus' death not merely covered over sin, but actually took it away. Let's look at it this way. Because we sin against God, both by choice and at times in ignorance, we need to experience forgiveness. There are times that we willfully sin, there are other times we sin, and we're not even aware of it, and then all of a sudden maybe we rethink it or someone brings it to our attention and we go, oh yeah, yeah, I guess I, I did say that, I guess, I guess I did do that. And yet the scripture tells us without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. So just as you can trace Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation, you can trace the price of blood to deal with sin from Genesis to Revelation. Because it started with the garments. God's provision for man's sin were garments through the shedding of blood. How can Adam and Eve restore their relationship with God? Their solution, fig leaves. There, that'll take care of it. Man's solution for sin today, denial. Cover up. Blame. It's a woman you gave me or whoever else we can blame. Generalize. Everyone sins. Nobody's perfect. I redefine the word sin. Oh, we all make mistakes. Well, I had an error in judgment. Yes, yes you did. And the Bible calls it sin. So redefining the terms or denying or covering up or blaming does not deal with our sin problem. 
The only solution, not fig leaves, but most people today are not seeking forgiveness. They're seeking acceptance. They're seeking respect. And so you have people who, if you bring their sin to their attention, uh, they may either just generalize, well, no one's perfect, or they may attack you. Who do you think you are judging me? So we all have our own defenses, but most of the time people want acceptance and respect. They don't want to deal with the sin. God's solution is the garments of skin. Blood alone covered the sin. Any questions as far as we've gone? So we have Adam, type of Christ. You have the seed that we find in the New Testament is referring to Christ. You have the garments, which is a foreshadowing of the cross. Because of sin, blood has to be shed. God gives them garments of skin. That merely covers up in the Old Testament, but in the future, there's going to be one who will hang on a cross, and he won't just cover up your sin. He's going to take it away. He's going to truly forgive that sin. So now let's look at our fourth individual, and this is Enoch. We mentioned him a little bit earlier, but Enoch actually preaches Jesus' second coming. He doesn't know he's preaching Jesus' second coming. But he makes a proclamation, and we don't even know exactly where this is because it's not recorded there in Genesis. But here is Jude. Well, let's look at Genesis first. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years, had other sons and daughters, and altogether, Enoch lived 365 years, and he walked with God, and was no more, because God took him. Now, often people look at this and see this as a type of rapture, and that is a possibility, that this is what's going to happen. Not everybody believes in the rapture, but as I look at the scriptures, it seems to make more sense to me that uh, there are two aspects of Christ's second coming. And the first one is that he comes for the church, the body of Christ. The second aspect is that he brings the church back to planet Earth, and he sets up his kingdom, and uh, right there in Jerusalem, and if you take the Bible from more of a literal perspective, that's the conclusion you almost have to come to. And there are other ways of interpreting that, but as you look at this, the rapture would be very much like what Enoch experienced. He is walking along, all of a sudden he is removed. Something like Elijah. You know, Elijah and Elisha are going across the Jordan River. And all of a sudden, the Bible says his chariot of fire comes down from heaven and takes Elijah up into heaven. So Elijah doesn't die. Enoch doesn't taste death. Uh, Moses did taste death as well as every other human being. So one of these days, uh, when the Lord comes back, it can be, I believe, at any time, that all of a sudden we're walking and whew, we don't exist here on planet Earth anymore. We are taken to be with Him. Others may focus on the fact that the Apostle Jew directly applies Enoch's ministry with the events of his day as well as in the future. Now think in terms of prophecy. Prophecy has a now and later kind of an aspect. When prophets prophesy, a lot of times what they are prophesying is in their very near future, but it also deals with a later future. 
so it's a now and, and, and not yet kind of focus. So here, Jude, the brother of the Lord. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. You know, he's saying the men who lived in my day, in the first century. The men of the first century, Jude says, are like the men of Enoch's day, but are also going to be like people when Jesus returns. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone, to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way, and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are grumblers, fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Does that sound like the 21st century? So we find that what was going on in Enoch's day, because you have that line of Cain, and you have the line of Seth, and Enoch was for the line of Seth and his looking around. And just like Noah later on, Noah becomes a preacher. Enoch is a preacher. And he's saying that, look, eventually the Lord is going to come. Now, he was just speaking about God's going to come and he's going to bring judgment. He's not defining it as a man called Jesus because he has no idea that there's going to be a man called Jesus who will be coming back. And so in his day, in Enoch's day, this is what was happening. In the first century, in Jude's day, this is what was happening. And in the 21st century, in our day, this is what is happening. And we know that in the future, the Lord's going to return and is going to bring judgment on mankind. So Enoch is a preacher of righteousness a man who walked with God. Then there's Noah. Again, Noah is a type of Christ in a number of ways. He's a preacher of righteous, righteousness who through obedience to God, he saved man from total annihilation. Now we all know how long it took him to build the ark. Took him many, many years. And during all that time, he is pleading with his neighbors, is pleading with anyone who will listen to him to repent. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And by this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Jesus, also a preacher of righteousness, who through obedience to God, saved man from total annihilation. For God did not send his world, son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So as Noah in his generation was preaching righteousness, preaching repentance so that people would be saved, so did Jesus do the same. Now Noah's righteousness saved his family from perishing. We're told in 2 Peter 2, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So all that Noah could save was his own household. <clears throat> Jesus, his righteousness saves those who place faith in him. Paul writes, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. 
So both Jesus and Noah, preachers of righteousness, saved those who were willing to trust him, place their faith in him. Now, even Jesus himself says, there's a comparison between myself and Noah. Because the days of Noah are the same as the days when the Son of Man is going to return. Jesus says, but concerning the day and the hour, no man knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will also be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. What's it going to be like when Jesus returns? Business as usual. No one's, I should say very few people will believe what the Bible says. They will not take the warning seriously. They will just go about their daily routine. And when the trumpet starts blowing, they are going to be totally shocked, totally surprised. And when it happens, it's like, why didn't someone tell me about this? Why didn't someone warn me about this? Well, you've been warned year after year, but have rejected the message. So as in the days of Noah, that's exactly how it's going to be when the Lord does return. Now, this is a little bit tricky here. <laughs> and we're going to look at a passage, and this is the one that we'll close with. <coughs> it's a passage in Genesis chapter 10. And when I first saw that, I thought, eh, I don't know about this. But the more I look into it, I'm saying, yeah, I can understand this. So look at Genesis. Remember as we went through the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we said in chapter 10 is the table of nations. And what's that about? Well, it tells you that all of us come from, not only from Adam, <laughs> but down through Noah and through his sons. Uh, so he has three sons Ham Shem and Japheth we are told this is the account of Shem Ham and Japheth Noah's sons who themselves had sons after the flood now let's look at Japheth I find this is extremely interesting. And in all the years I have preached and taught the scriptures, it was only in the last couple of years where I had one of these wow insights. And that's look at Japheth. Let's look at his sons. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 2. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, Tyrus. Now, any of those names make you think about anything in the future? All right, Magog. Who else? Meshach. Or Meshach, yeah. What about Tubal and Gomer? Okay, let's... Now, we're on a little rabbit trail, but let's hop around here. Turn to the book of Ezekiel. Whenever Old Testament prophets, you have Ezekiel and Daniel... 
and we're going to go to uh, 30 38 now I preached this before numerous times and I think I gave the wrong some wrong insights because I always thought that this was primarily talking about Russia but let's look at this chapter 38 of Ezekiel the word of the Lord came to me son of man set your face against Gog of the land of Magog the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal prophesy against him and say this is what the sovereign Lord says I am against you O Gog chief prince of Meshech and Tubal I will turn you around put hooks in your jaws and bring you out with your whole army your horses horsemen fully armed and a great horde with large and small shields all of them brandishing their swords Persia what's Persia Iran Cush and put any idea Cush and put okay you have Ethiopia what else well let's keep on going uh, all the shields helmets with them Gomer with all its troops and Beth uh, Togarma from the far north with all its troops and many nations with you all right you can keep on reading that uh, chapter and you're going to find that he's going to bring these peoples against Israel and just when they think they're going to win the battle Bible says that's when uh, God is going to strike these armies. Remember the idea of Armageddon? Uh, there is no battle of Armageddon. Armageddon is a place where people meet. It's the valley of Jezreel. And from up in Jezreel they come south and then go up to Jerusalem and they surround Jerusalem. And these are the armies that are going to surround. <clears throat> now the question, where are these nations? Where did Japheth go? Well, let's look at it. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Hmm. By the way, that's blessed be Yahweh, blessed be Jehovah. I always thought, at least for a long time, that the first time we read about Jehovah is when God reveals himself to Moses in the book of Exodus. When Moses asked the question, well, you want me to go down there to Egypt and tell the people God wants me to take you out? And they ask, what God? What should I say? Who are you? I don't even know your name. God says, you tell them, I am that I am. That's Yahweh. That's that's the name Jehovah I am the self-existing God well that's not the first time that name is used it's used right here in the book of Genesis chapter 9 blessed be Yahweh the God of Shem so out of three sons only one son is mentioned Uh, I'm just looking at my dog wanting to come. He's just coming back in here. Should have told my wife not to let him out in the first place. <laughs> Buddy, come here. Buddy, come here. Lie down. Down. All right, you stay there now. Yeah, okay. So, blessed be the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. Oh, where'd Canaan come from? Well, he is one of the sons of Ham. And he is the one who was being cursed. 
and somehow Canaan is going to be the slave of Shem. And may God extend the territory of Japheth, and may Japheth live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his slave. All right, let's continue. From Shem come the Shemites. We call them the Semites. Now Noah blessed the Yahweh of Shem. And apparently Yahweh was the God of Shem. Buddy, stay down. We're going to be here. When Israel entered the promised land, Cain became the servant of Shem. And we find this in Joshua chapter 9. When Joshua goes into the land and he was told, don't make any covenants with the people who are close by. You can make agreements with those who are far away, but not those who are close by. And there are a group of people called the Gibeonites. <clears throat> they live very close to where Joshua was. But they said, look, they're going to put us to death. How do we get them to make a covenant with us? Oh, well, let's pretend we're from a far country. And so they put on ragged clothes. They got stale, moldy bread. And they come and they meet Joshua. And they said, we come from a far country, so please make a treaty with us. And so the Bible says, Joshua, as great a man as he was, Joshua did not inquire of God. But instead, he looked at the external appearance. He saw the bread was moldy. He saw that the clothes were ragged. And then he came to his conclusion, yes, they are from a far country. And he makes a treaty with them. And then he, they discover that, no, these are our neighbors. And we just violated what God told us to do. And so they said, okay, we promised we wouldn't kill you. But from here on, you are going to be our slaves. You're going to be water carriers for us. And so here were the Canaanites who are now under Shem because the Israelites come from Shem. <clears throat> so the Canaanites become the slave of the Shemites. So part of this is carried out. And of course, later on, it's, it's fully carried out. But let's go on. Let's look at these territories. Ham, mostly in the area of Africa, there's Egypt on the green, Canaan, the land of Canaan, which is present-day Israel, that was all from Ham, sons of Ham. Shem, basically what we call Saudi Arabia area, goes over into Persia, over into Iran. Up there is uh, Babylon, all that, or Semites, Shemites. And look at Japheth. Yeah, that is Europe, uh, but it, notice Turkey. And notice where these places are. You stay there, buddy. I don't know how much of this you can see. Uh, here's Gomer, here's Magog, here's Meshek, uh, Tubal. So you look at these and you say, man, looks like Turkey is going to be involved in the last days. <clears throat> and I know when we had gone to Turkey, it was a very different kind of a political atmosphere. It was still very, very secular. But with the new Turkish government, well, it's been at least a decade or so, uh, moving more and more and more and more to much more of, of a uh, Islamic state, much more... Um, many more restrictions and you're going to see more and more of this grow in that area but this is where we're going to focus is on Shem 
when you look at the lineage it's a little hard to see but you go down to it starts with God Adam Noah Shem Abraham Judah David Jesus so our Lord comes through the whole line of Shem the Shemites and we go from Adam to Noah to Shem to Abraham to Judah from which come the Israelites to Joseph to Christ so as you follow back the lineage of the Lord we get right back into the tents of Shem and the Shemites and so we see Jesus in a number of different ways shadowed in the Old Testament types of the Old Testament eventually we're going to see very specific prophecies in the Old Testament as we do there in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 okay has this been <laughs> insightful I sure hope hope it has been because believe me teaching the scriptures for as long as I have I just keep on getting these aha moments saying man I never saw that before I never knew that and that's one one of the great things about the Word of God it's something you never get tired of and you never learn it all and the more I am in the scriptures the more I realize what I don't know about the Bible okay any other comments oh I did ask those who are watching through video if you have any comments any questions to send them to us and uh, Phyllis Henderson remember Phyllis well she asked a question uh, when you asked me a question about the Torah and I gave you an answer she said I'm not sure that's the right answer so I had to recheck do you remember the question you asked me about the Torah I, th I think it was is there a Torah in English mm. and my response was yes but I would then I looked it up to make sure that uh, there are some Torahs in English but I would say that 99.9% .9 of Torahs are strictly in Hebrew but you have the Torah translations, which is the first five books of the Bible that are in English. So I hope that sort of clarifies it. And I have to be very careful now that I have more people <laughs> listening. And I, and I welcome any questions or comments. Uh, when you think I'm wrong, or you, you wonder why in the world did you say that, just send in your questions, your comments, and We'll try to straighten it out at a, at a later time. Lord, thank you for visiting with us today. I thank you for helping us to see some things we haven't seen before. And I pray that uh, what we have learned will begin uh, its wonderful work in our lives. In the Savior's name, amen.